just a couple of minutes uh, until uh, while Phil's getting his camera and everything turned on. Uh, but Phil's going to be talking about API code first versus design first. Oh, and looks like we got Phil in here. Maybe. Hello. Oh. All right. Hey, there's Phil. Maybe. All right. Not too bad. Not too bad. I'm realizing now I probably should have combed my hair, but you know, never mind. <laughs> hey, that's that's all right. I, I Zoom meetings as my mirrors most mornings anyway, yeah. so that, that's all good. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, the stage is all yours. I will uh, let you get into it right now. Great. Thank you very much. Um, hmm. Just got to figure out the share one moment. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, no worries. Entire so, screen. There we go. Got it. Yeah. All right. There um, we go. You see. Nice. All right. We see it. Uh, take it away. So, um, yeah, I'm here to talk about APA design first and evolve. Which <laughs> the only things I care about as much as uh, like designing good quality APIs are, are riding bikes and, uh, and trying to save the planet from the impending apocalypse. Um, I used to work at WeWork uh, about 18 months ago. It was my last role. And I had a fair few kind of um, revolutionary uh, ideas there just trying to sort the mess out at the company. Um, the company is publicly a bit of a mess now, but it was previously internally a mess. Um, there was no API documentation whatsoever when I got there. Um, my goal was to join the company and help them make their APIs better. My friend literally said, can you please help us with our APIs? Um, but there was no documentation. There was no real design or planning. Um, there was no concept of the life cycle. People just did stuff. Um, the API lifecycle, I think you've just heard uh, probably quite a lot of interesting stuff from Mike about this, but um, uh, Nicholas Massé wrote, made this really cool diagram where you kind of start off with strategy, design it, mock it, test it, implement um, that, that, that uh, design, uh, deploy it up there, secure it, manage it. Um, and then you have this other feedback loop, which is coming from your consumers who are somehow discovering that your API exists. They are um, building code against it and they're consuming it in, uh, in production. Um, you're then monitoring those interactions and figuring out where you can monetize things. Um, and, and that feeds back into strategy for, for new APIs or for improving the existing APIs. And it's this kind of double feedback loop that hopefully makes everything better and more in line with what your consumers need. But um, Oh, we work the the strategy part was usually just people come together and have a meeting. Normally strategy is, um, you know, a bunch of uh, business people explain that they need a system that it, it uh, needs to offer a certain amount of information or um, a previous API is starting to show faults. And so you need to come up with a new one that solves problems better. Um, but at, at WeWork, it, you, you'd have that meeting and someone would just start writing code like right there and then. Um, oh. And let me just put up to disturb on amateur hour over here. Um, so yeah, they just start writing code pretty much immediately, which meant there wasn't any chance for them to design the API really either because they just had the code and that was that. Um, there was no real need to mock because you had the code. Um, so the design uh, lifecycle, the, the API lifecycle in my previous role was basically this. It was just do a bunch of code and then hopefully it will work and then money somehow. Um, and that's not necessarily the best life cycle. So while I was there, I was trying to help them resolve a bunch of these issues. And some of the questions that popped up are, should we use Swagger, OpenAPI, Blueprint, Raml? Um, Mike mentioned two of those in, in his talk. Um, if you do them, should you use like annotations in your code or YAML or JSON? Uh, design first versus code first. Um, why do you have to do so much stuff by hand? Why are there new like visual editors to help out? When does documentation get involved? When does mocking get involved? And how do we keep code and docs in sync. That's probably one of the biggest problems people have. Uh, the first simple part of this, if you're trying to figure out which you should use, I, I'm, I'm less use what you want um, than Mike was. Uh, uh, Open API really is um, the way to go these days. Uh, things like API Blueprint are, are much smaller and terser and you can kind of write them out quickly. So maybe for kind of sketching, like you said, um, is a great way to go. But uh, the one you should be putting your most effort into is Open API. It has the largest amount of tooling, the largest amount of company support. If you're not familiar with it, it's an API description format for creating HTTP API descriptions. Um, and usually it lives in an open API.yaml or .json if you want. Um, and it can be called anything. It's just convention-wise, it's usually called that. It will 
usually look a bit like this, but it will look a bit like this. You have uh, info with metadata, um, descriptions, contact information, so someone knows who to shout at when you make mistakes, um, a list of all your servers. So you might want to have the real API and a sandbox API people can play around in without obliterating their data or charging their credit card. Um, and then you list out your paths. Uh, so you have a little slash for the root root. This isn't an introduction to open API, so I won't spend too much time on it, but you quite often have stuff that looks like this. You, you describe your service layer and your data layer. So you describe what all the requests and responses look like. Another example might be users. Um, you have uh, their name. You might want to point out that no emojis are allowed in there and there's a max length for some reason. Um, you can add formats like uh, email for email address and you can add example values to explain what kind of formats might be acceptable. So Open API is supported by all of these folks, including Apiary, who made um, API Blueprint, and MuleSoft, who made Raml. So a lot of support, even from people that made their own version of the thing. Um, and that means you don't have to worry about, like, maybe this will vanish or go away. Like, it's a legit thing. So as for annotations or YAML, this is controversial. Um, and I think the arguments for it have changed a lot, but people haven't noticed. So in a lot of languages like Java, if you have actual annotations as a first class like syntax feature in your language, you can actually kind of do this interesting stuff where you you describe the uh, the API endpoint next to the implementation of the endpoint. And, and theoretically, this seems great having stuff next to each other. You know, it's pretty good. And especially if you have, can if you can use uh, constants, you get, you know, um, code checks as you're doing it. But in a lot of languages, it ends up looking a bit like this. Uh, PHP is working on getting annotations. I think they're coming in version eight, but it doesn't have them yet and tooling hasn't caught up. So you end up with this kind of mess of stuff with no syntax highlighting because it's just a comment. Um, and, and it gets really long. The more like parameters and headers and, and, and you know, response body parts you get, the longer this gets. And you can, you can scroll down past 100 lines of stuff to look at the code. Um, and that means it's no longer quite as simplistic as, as you might have thought when, when you kind of look at smaller examples. Um, in JavaScript, it just looks like this. They just put uh, at Swagger, and then they just dump the whole YAML in there. So you haven't actually avoided writing YAML. You're still doing it just in an annotation. So. Um, there's a lot of people will say things like, you know, putting the annotation, uh, putting the description next to the code means that people are more likely to keep it up to date. And there's a lot of ifs and buts involved in that. Like you're hoping the developer notices, uh, you're hoping they notice or remember if they do notice and remember, you're hoping that they know how to do it. Um, and you probably aren't going to get syntax, um, feedback because it's just a comment. Um, and you might not have IDE tools that support that arbitrary kind of format. So. Um, in my experience, code comments are usually correct for a short period of time, and then it's just nonsense. Um, if you're more of a visual learner, uh, this is the concept. <laughs> like, just because it's near something doesn't make it true. Don't confuse accuracy with proximity. Um, so generally not a big fan of annotations either. Code first versus design first is the next thing, because you can use annotations and design first, and you could do code first. Um, you can kind of mix these things around. Annotations aren't inherently code first, but because you're annotating code that exists, it's the go-to method for people who do code first. You can do design first um, in in code, but you have to like create all these empty uh, files and classes and empty models and then just put annotations by them. So it's a bit weird. Most people don't do that. But when asking, I did a little poll to see who who's code first, um, who who's entirely design first, at their organization, who is entirely code first, who used to be code first and is switching to design first, and who is some other awkward combination. And awkward combination was the winner at 35.5% of 300 people asked. Um, that's not great, <laughs> but it is impressive to see that 21% 20, uh, of people are already entirely design first at their company. And you know another 20% are adopting it. Um, <laughs> it's just a few other people that are kind of stuck somehow. But I've talked about these concepts a bit. And, and for people that aren't really familiar with what they actually mean or how they actually look at a, a small or a large organization, uh, let me do an overview. Um, code first and docs when we have time is one of the code first variants. And it usually looks like this. This is most companies um, a year or two or three ago. Basically, you plan it, 
somehow it could be on uh, a whiteboard or it could be on the back of a cocktail napkin it could be absolutely anywhere um could be in any form this is sometimes you know referred to as sketching as mike emerson just just was outlining um but you know sketching is is good um, and then you want to move up to kind of more formal planning and a lot of people don't really bother with that they just kind of get an excel spreadsheet or a whiteboard and just put in a bunch of notes about methods and endpoint names and whatever and then they go well, that'll do let's write some code and you spend a month writing that prototype or whatever, you get a bunch of feedback from the customer that it's not very good. And that might take you like another week to implement all that feedback. And eventually you say, well, no time for any more feedback because we have to hit the deadline. It's taking us a week to implement these changes in this code. We just don't have time. So we're going to deploy it. And OK, lots of compromises were made, but great. We did it. Party. Uh, we'll write the documentation later because we just really stressed ourselves to hit that deadline. Um, so then after a certain amount of time, a new customer has appeared, uh, they would like to use the API, but they're not quite sure how, because the documentation either doesn't exist or was rushed for that customer when they phoned up. Um, the API developers have been called back in to try and work on it. They've totally forgot how it works. They've looked through the code to find out how it works, but there's been, <laughs> um, but they've just generally, uh, it's been rather confusing because they've had to kind of stick to this this initial plan that wasn't really meeting the uh, the requirements. So they kind of like hacked a lot of stuff around. So what generally ends up happening is, uh, this happened a bunch at WeWork, people would build a brand new global version or a brand new API because the initial one was too hard to figure out how it actually worked and they didn't want to onboard new customers. So back to planning somehow and sharing the napkin around. And this, this cycle goes on. Um, I have absolutely built APIs this way. It's terrible. Um, all of the APIs at my past job were done this way. It's terrible. Um, Another variation, which is the annotation stuff we just talked about, does simplify a lot of this, and it's why it's so popular. Um, first, you write a bunch of code, and then you annotate that code almost immediately, even while you're doing the code. And that means that you can share documentation whenever you want. It's, it's immediately there. And so when you want to get customer feedback, you can share the docs with them um, and maybe deploy the code all at the same time. Uh, and they immediately know how it works. And hopefully the docs and the code actually line up. You don't really know. But um, when new functionality is requested, it means that you can just kind of add that one new endpoint and add the docs for that one new endpoint. And it's all kind of done at the same time. But you still have this really long feedback loop where customer feedback has to go back to writing a bunch of code and annotating it and then you know deploying it again. So that, that customer feedback loop is still quite large. I personally think if you're trying to build a house, uh, you don't just randomly build it and then like sketch it later when someone asks for the blueprint because they want to do an extension. You you plan it first. You see what might or might not work. You get an expert to take a look at that blueprint. And then um, when you, you build it according to that specification. If someone builds it differently, then you get to say, uh, here's the blueprint. That's not what we agreed on. And, and things work out quite well. When you want to build an extension, you already have this perfect documentation of how your house is built because you did it before you built it. And I honestly don't see why that would be different for something as important as an API, which is going to like hold your entire company together, right? Um, so most API planning, even if you are uh, doing it on, however you're doing it, on a whiteboard, on a napkin, even if you use enterprise UML based software, like that's usually not particularly machine readable um, and napkins definitely aren't. So uh, what I like to, uh, what was popular for a while when I started recommending for a while was kind of while we were all getting to grips with design first um, is that you design it with open API, you immediately get mocks and docs uh, mocks are like a prototype that you didn't have to code. It's just generated from that YAML. Um, and then docs, people can look at the documentation if they don't really want to play around with that fake API. Um, and so that, because they're automated from the designs that you're building, you can see them update in real time while you're designing them. Um, you can then get that customer feedback really, really easily without having to write any code. And it then the, the bit that's tricky then is that I've seen lots and lots of people kind of uh, evangelizing this approach um, where you have this design phase and then afterwards you are done with design and you won't ever need any design anymore. And if you remember those two um, feedback cycles, that design is never done. You, you have version one of the API, whether you globally version or not, you have version one of the API and then you, and then you have new changes coming in. You add new endpoints, you very carefully evolve it over time if you're using evolution or, or whatever. You, there's always changes that are coming. Um, and so a lot of these tools will say, you know, design it with this lovely designer and then export it 
and then go and, you know, the code is the source of truth now. You either import that into your API console like Postman and poke around with it um, and, and, and just code everything after that. Or you generate your code and throw the throw the um, initial machine readable YAML away. And, and from there on out, it's back to those code first uh, loops that we, we looked at before. So the uh, improvement on this is design first and evolve with code. Um, this is stuff we were doing. We work. It's it's uh, pretty fun. Same exact start. You you do all the way through designing mocks and docs, customer feedback, and then you use Open API to simplify the code. This is something that is a bit of a like light bulb moment for a lot of people, and they just don't get it for a while. <laughs> Hopefully, this talk will help. Um, you use open API files to simplify your code. You can then deploy all that code. And when new functionality is requested, you know for a fact that your, um, your stuff is up to date because there's no difference between your descriptions and your code. Your descriptions are code. And so when someone wants a new endpoint or a new property added in, you know for a fact that your descriptions are up to date. And you also don't spend that long coding it because you just work on um, design firsting this endpoint. And so the life cycle we came up with at WeWork was basically uh, the development lifecycle was right, send pull requests, uh, get feedback on that. You can lint, you can automatically lint it and have contract testing done with these open API descriptions. If that works, you have team review. This is sometimes re referred to as like API um, design reviews. Um, it, on the most basic level, it could literally be someone looking at the YAML PR and saying, that looks good, uh, but there's much more advanced tooling around than that. Um, and again, while you're writing it, you should have linting feedback to help you make sure that the uh, the open API you're writing is good and the API that you're describing in that open API is good. And we'll show you more on that in a sec. Then I can, we, we built this like API aggregator, which would clone all of the repos, take all of the open API out, um, upgrade it all to version three or convert it from various different formats from people that were stubborn. Um, and then we would automatically create a mock server, create API reference documentation, um, make it available for end-to-end -end acceptance testing, um, and then generate SDKs and mirror it off to Postman so people could use their, their favorite HTTP client without having to change anything. Um, and they loved that because they wouldn't have to manually keep all those Postman collections up to date. They would just be done based off of their open API. And so this was something I did pretty much by myself, completely held together with duct tape and string. And every single day, I talked to more developers from more companies, Salesforce, HSBC, any giant company, any small startup, everyone is doing all of this with duct tape and string and sacrificing goats and hamsters. And it's just nonsense. We don't need to do doc ops ourselves. Um, the solutions uh, I, I was struggling with, basically the color code system here is green is great. Uh, red is not done and uh, yellow is needs work. And the hardest part I had with trying to convince people to use this workflow at WeWork was um, that the design part actually kind of sucked. Like people were writing YAML by hand and there were no visual editors. So I've mentioned it, it kind of sucks and it's not just my opinion. Um, writing a bunch of YAML, you know, open API is great for describing APIs, but Doing it all by hand, there's so many keywords and there's so much nested YAML that it can often be confusing. I myself on live demos forget which order the keywords go in. And so this this uh, person, Sebastian Armand, um, wrote this article uh, with this quote, but introducing his, his own DSL. Um, DSL, domain specific language, is he, he created this open API uh, DSL to avoid having to write open API because he hates it. But Honestly, if I had to write all this, I don't know if I'd be any happier. Like this is just changing the complexity. It's not reducing the complexity. You've just instead of being able to use tools that support Open API directly, you now have this much smaller number of tools that support this DSL. And so you have to like find syntax highlighters and you have to, you know, export it to Open API and it just adds complexity to the build chain. So um I don't know if DSLs are necessarily the answer. I consider them to be a crutch because there didn't used to be good editors. So where are they? There's a bunch. OpenAPI.tools is a website I maintain along with um, Matthew Trask. And we have a whole section on GUI editors, graphical user interface editors. I work for a company called Stoplight now, who makes one. Um, it's actually kind of why I worked there. I, I started giving a lot of feedback on their new generation of tooling that was coming out and, and shaping it to solve a lot of my, my, my own needs and problems. Um, 
and, and so now I can easily say it's the best in the space because I helped make it be uh, what I think is quite good. Basically, Studio uh, Stoplight has a few different tools and a few different parts of the ecosystem that solve all of these problems, right? So uh, write open API instead of doing it, it by hand in your in, in any text editor, you can use Studio, which will give you a graphical interface. Um, it even kind of helps make team reviews easier. Uh, it has Spectral, which is a linter. Uh, Prism can do contract testing via a validation proxy. Um, you don't have to build your own complicated aggregator. We call it the analyzer. And it just, it's an, um, an uh, OAuth application or integrates with GitHub and, and GitLab and Bitbucket or whatever. We just, we get little webhooks in and then analyze the changes that came in. Um, we host mock servers for you. Uh, we don't make SDK, uh, SDKs, but you're welcome to do that because the open API lives in your repo. And we handle end-to-end uh, -to -end testing and, and documentation for you. So again, no more doc ops required. Like my experiences at that company mean that I can kind of help shape this um, uh, functionality. And so you don't have to bother doing it all anymore. And so the designer is is really simple. It's got a graphical interface. You can add new uh, APIs, endpoints, models. You can update the names. You get told if you're doing things wrong. You can, you know, all these different things, add different security methods and change formats. It works wherever your Git currently is with whatever Git branching model you currently have. Um, if you're using the platform, the online uh, like hosted version, then uh, you can clone, you can integrate this with any of those GitLab, whatever, uh, and, and clone things down to your browser, which is really exciting. Um, it's like an actual file editor that lives in the browser with your repos. And if you're using Studio Desktop, you can just open any local repository, whether it's Git or not. If it has Git, you can pull and push and all that sort of branch and stuff and just work with your existing files, which most of these other editors or none of these other editors do. They kind of help you work with stuff that's trapped in their walled garden. Um, and then you have to like import and export, but this just is editing your repo wherever you want to edit it. So it's a bit different and it helps with really complicated stuff like all of, one of, any of, refs and all different things. One of the most important things, whether you use Studio or not, is, is linting. And I'm a big fan of this. Um, Spectral is baked into Studio and it will give you feedback saying uh, whatever rules you want to build or use our custom rules, it will help you build better open API. There's something I really enjoy doing is using the custom rule sets to um, create rules that will make the API better. Um, and so we call it API description linting. Um, sometimes people talk about API style guides and, and those are usually like a PDF or a website somewhere. This is this is just kind of taking the same concept and, and automating it and turning it into something you can run in CI or in, in your development process. You can lint these API descriptions using our tools. And you can do uh, spectral CLI, um, or you can do VS Code spectral, or you can use a GitHub action, or you can just use Studio where it's built in, and they'll all give you the same answers, right? So this this is a custom rule where it says paths must be kebab case, and you've got one with an underscore in it, boo, and it will show up wherever you do it. Other rules that I like to put in, um, error responses should be RFC 7807. Maybe you've never heard of it. Check it out on Google. It's really cool. Uh, or the JSON, error, uh, JSON API error format. So if somebody was to start building an API and they were to start writing their own custom error format, it would say, no, 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 please don't do that. We don't need more custom Snowflake uh, formats. Please use an existing format. So Spectral is not only kind of uh, helping you find out if you made mistakes, it's, it's pushing you away from making mistakes before you've even written any code. Uh, because you're designing this before you write code, you have feedback on your API before you waste time. Um, it, it means that you are kind of creating consistent APIs. And as for mocks, it, it got really simple um, then at that point, because uh, there's a bunch of tools around for this open API, open API that tools once again, but we've got mocking and um, uh, we've got local mock servers and hosted mock servers that you can run. So single command, you get fake API, tells you all the endpoints, you can work with it. Or there's a URL, uh, for the hosted server and you can interact with that. You can give that to your mobile developers and see how they integrate. Documentation, once again, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can uh, deploy it to S3 with any one of the many tools that you run on the command line to generate HTML. Um, or you can, you know, the analyzer approach, like I mentioned, it reads from the Git repo whenever you push to your default branch. Uh, we do that at Stoplight for you. Um, you can publish multiple branches, um, but the default one, uh, usually main or master will update whenever you merge to it. And 
another handy thing, we put some automated uh, code samples in there so that people can play around in whatever language without you having to write all that code. Uh, and the last part, which we'll have to do quick, is uh, how do we keep code and docs in sync? This is usually the biggest problem people have. You have in your API, you've written this validation logic that explains that max length is 20 and the format is email and the type is integer or whatever. And then you go and copy all of that information in this other format in your reference documentation, right? That seems a little silly. That's two sources of truth and we don't want that. Some people put their validation in the model or the controller or the view if you're one of those people or make a new service or they make a new contract. And those contracts in Ruby look like this. Um, you kind of do all this stuff and maybe you have regex and maybe you can make things optional and maybe you can write a little bit of code. And this is more logic that you now need to write tests for. Um, in Joy, in JavaScript, it looks like this. And again, this is a little bit less gross, um, but I think this one's mostly deprecated now anyway. And all of that stuff is just the same information that you've already created in your API design, uh, just in another format. You've already got it in YAML, which is machine readable. You might as well use that. And you don't want to write a bunch of code yourself, but um, yeah, you don't want to be checking for so different sources of truth. Dread is a tool that can help with this in a way. It's mostly checking that the examples in your documentation are correct against the API. It's not really testing that your API does everything it should do. Um, and it also is quite complicated for a lot of different reasons. Um, so I think you should reuse descriptions for validation. And that looks a bit like this. You have this description document, your API leverages that for validation logic, your uh, reference docs just display that. And that looks a bit like this. In Ruby, you point your middleware at the openapi.yaml uh, using this one tool called committee, which is pretty good. And it will just bounce any requests that are invalid. In PHP, it's a bit more verbose, but it's the same concept. You create a middleware, you point the, uh, point the open API at it, and then you, you register it, and it will just give you an error. So if somebody made, makes a request saying, you know, widget price uh, was a string and it should have been an integer, bam, you didn't have to write that code. It just did it for you. And these things are available in every single language. There's a bunch in, different, in some languages. And what's cool about this is if you had validation code there already, because you're in the awkward combination category, you can just delete that and you're moving towards being entirely design first. If it's a new application and you've been following design first, then you never need to write that validation code in the first place. You will have to write some validations like, is this email unique? Because uh, OpenAPI isn't looking into your database and doesn't honestly care. Um, it's just talking about the contract going in and out, but that's still like 95% of stuff is taken care of for you. And what's left is integration and end-to-end -end testing um, and contract te testing, which is going to, uh, well, your existing test suite proves that your requests are uh, working and you need to figure out responses. Responses are the easiest. Some middlewares will do it, but honestly, I think it's a bit weird to have like your production code seeing if the response was right or wrong. You should have figured that out already. Um, so your test suite can actually take care of that. Uh, you can contract test, um, by splitting your models out into other files using ref and open API, you're not only making your open API more dry and not having 5,000 lines of it, but you can also have this one line assertion using a bunch of different tools. I've got a blog post on it here and these slides will be available on online. Um, but you can basically just say, did that response match this current schema? And if it doesn't, your test suite will fail. So there's no confusion about whether your API and your reference docs and whatever are all, are all exactly the same. You can even do client-side validation, but that's a whole other topic. You can have this one source of truth for all of the different places that care about what a contract should be um, instead of duplicating it in loads of different places. So just to finish up, you're going to design it first with open API, get your mocks and docs made automatically, get customer feedback based off of those things. Use open API to reduce how much code you need to write and to make your tests better quality. Deploy all of that together and have your docs automatically go up for free. Um, and then whenever people request new information, everything's correct already and you don't have to worry about whether it is or not. Um, and you can just add a new endpoint nice and easily. And with that, I think I'm a little bit over, so I won't have time for questions. But if I can get a copy of them um, offline, then I will answer. Right on. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, Phil. And uh, yeah, we're, we're uh, no time for questions, a little bit over. So uh, so definitely check those out. We'll get you a copy. And uh, just stand by for just one second. We got your next speaker coming on stage. All right. Here we go. See you, Phil. Thank you so much. <laughs>